at. Uh, so please visit our IOA website and you can click on the webinar and access to all the recorded uh, webinar. And after this webinar, it, uh, it will also be available online. Also, we will have the Q and the A question, uh, Q and the A session afterwards. Uh, but uh, the Q and the A session is not going to be recorded. So uh, this is just a, a general, uh, uh, you know, uh, steps that we are going to uh, follow. Uh, so first, I want to, to uh, introduce uh, our today's speaker. Okay. So it's really our great uh, pleasure to have Professor Fei Duqing as our today's speaker. So Fei is a professor emeritus uh, of economics at the Russell Polytechnic Institute and a previous IOA president. So she served for six years as the Dean of the School of Humanity, Arts and the Social Science of the Russell uh, uh, Polytechnic Institute. So she collaborated for 20 years with uh, uh, Wesley Leonti at the Institute for Economic Analysis and uh, succeed him as the director of the IEA. So she has been actively engaged with both the IAOA and also the Indus International Society for Industrial Ecology. So in the recent years, she and her immediate colleagues have created a family of models of the world economy and the databases that will allow for choices among alternative future options for action. Those models have been applied in a number of empirical uh, studies, mainly focused on food and agriculture, water and energy. So most recently, uh, they extended the world trade model to allow for human migration, na namely allowing for the global mo uh, mobility of labor in this era of rising immigration from some regions and the falling rate of fatality in other regions. So today, face talk is extending the scope of input output models to address 21st century challenges. Uh, so the presentation will be 30 minutes and will follow with the Q&A session for 15 to 20 minutes. Fei, please, uh, the floor is yours. Please get started. Uh, how do I get my PowerPoint back up, Christian? Uh, you, uh, it's, it's not there. I can see your PowerPoint. Perfect. OK, mm -hmm. so it's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be with you all today. And I want to thank Kishang for inviting me because that was the stimulus for me to uh, try to bring together in one story a lot of the things that I've been thinking about and working on uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so I've called it extending the scope of input output models to um, address 21st century challenges. And all of us are well familiar with what the challenges are, uh, climate change and change to the biosphere more generally, um, large inequalities and growing inequalities, um, the provision of water, food, energy, pandemics, uh, global migration, uh, debt crisis, the prospect for global debt crisis, geopolitical rivalries, violence, even war. Um, and so I think that um, I, I will try to make the case that our input output framework uh, can and needs to be extended, but is very well suited to developing uh, scenarios or strategies and then scenarios for both sustainability, environmental sustainability, 
and for economic development. And that the keys here are the changes in technologies, but also the changes in household behaviors. And so I want to put out there some ideas for next steps. And the overview is I want to talk a little bit about Vasily Leontiev and about George Danzig. Um, I want to focus on built capital. And for representing built capital, we need a dynamic input output model that has some new features that the past ones have not had. Um, we need to do some new things in order to be able to uh, represent scenarios about alternative household lifestyles. Um, and I suggest we really need to put this into a global framework for scenario analysis for a number of reasons. OK, so um, everybody here is familiar with Vasily Leontiev. And um, I want to point out the, the central idea that he had in the 1930s as he was developing what became input-output um, economics is that he wanted to create what he called an empirical science because he found that economics at that time um, was about abstract theorizing and that instead one needed to have a theory building that went hand in hand with collecting the data so that the theorist and the person analyzing the data um, were one and the same. And I'll come back to that later. But the other thing I wanted to point out about him is um, that in 1941, he worked with the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics that create the, the National Bureau, part of the Department of Labor, that was funded to create um, a presence in Cambridge so that they could work with him. And the question before the United States entered World War II was, what would be the prospects for the US economy after the war was over if the US entered? And that study based on a 1939 input-output table um, really made a lot of difference for launching input-output economics. So those were scenarios about the future. And then in 1970, uh, the United Nations created a new program, the International Development Strategy, for how to close the economic gaps between the rich and the poor countries by the, world, by the year 2000. And they commissioned uh, Professor Leontiev to do a study about that. And this was the occasion for his creating um, the first world model um, at a meso level of detail in order to look at scenarios about uh, development um, in the developing parts of the world for 2000. So he had, there's a lot of precedent here um, of looking not only or mainly even at the past, but using this framework to analyze possible scenarios for the future. Now, I mentioned George Danzig, who is widely called uh, the father of linear programming. Um, and um, it's interesting to me because I've been using uh, constrained optimization models based on his work for many years now, and I never realized um, something that I've been reading about only recently, which is that by the 1980s, he was writing reflections about the origins of linear programming. He actually says that when in the early 40s, he saw for the first time the, the work of Leontief and, and put out the tables, he was struck by the, quote, remarkable mathematical properties of the input-output matrix, uh, the interdependence of the different variables. And he decided right away with a strike of insight that this was su just suited to the ideas he had in mind for linear programming and that it would generalize input-output analysis. And uh, I think he 
was right on that many decades ago. And I just for I think that a lot of you are familiar with linear programming, but I just wanted to point out that we uh, look at the basic input output model and then basic <laughs> linear program. Um, there is the intermediate equation here with the asterisks. The asterisks mean that these matrices are no longer square, so we're not no longer talking about inverse matrices, and they're not square because they've got a lot of alternative technologies for the different sectors. Um, but this the solution here, the choice of which technologies will be used, are constrained by factor availability and by choosing an, an objective to among the different plausible um, solutions. And so um, I've used the notation here from input output, but I think it's really clear to see that that um, similarity that uh, Danzig picked up on right away. OK, now I said I wanted to focus on built um, built capital. And by public and in fact, by uh, public infrastructure in particular, because um, both for environmental sustainability and for economic development, infrastructure is critical. And if we look at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, they have their um, um, weaknesses, um, I think, but um, what they do show very clearly is the importance of infrastructures. A number of the SDGs are devoted to infrastructure for energy, water, sanitation, but also healthcare, education. Um, and I believe that, um, that these technologies, these new designs with the new technologies also need to be customized for different places because of the environment in which they find themselves, but also for cultural reasons, for density of population. And what we need to represent then are the different technologies, those that differ from what been, has been put in place in the economies that already have this infrastructure. We need to evaluate the costs. We need to be sure that there are funding sources and that there's an ability to repay um, the, the loans. And of course, all of this applies to private um, infrastructure or private built capital also, um, including buildings, residences, um, and durable equipment. Um, well, to represent um, infrastructure, to represent built capital, one needs a dynamic input output model. And what dynamic means here, as in other contexts, is that when taking decisions in the present, um, one is constrained by things that have happened in the past, like the capacity of the built capital that's already in place. Um, and also, one has to take into account um, what's in view what's uh, envisaged for the future that one has to start working on now. And so in the static input output model, it's just about the present, but now the past and the future come in also. And um, the two dynamic input output models that um, I'm familiar with um, are on the one hand, one that I developed with Daniel Schild in 1985, where we focused on the need of the sectors that wanted to expand their capacity. And a few days, a few years later, Steve Levine and Ellie Romanoff um, wrote a paper on a dynamic input output model. And it's really interesting, um, and I didn't know this until many years later, um, they are engineers and they had a different perspective on what dynamics meant. And they were concerned with the providing sectors. In other words, the construction and engineering sectors. And so, um, and I've been working with Steve Levine now for a number of years. And what we're working on right now is building 
um, a dynamic input output model that takes uh, these two perspectives um, in, into brings them together, both built capital from the point of view of the client sectors that want to buy the built capital and the provider sectors that need time to deliver on them. And um, I think that some of the things we'll be thinking about that we are thinking about are classifications for the provider sectors because um, most of us, I believe, um, who've worked with static input output models um, haven't been that mindful of the uh, classification for the construction and engineering sectors. Um, and so we want to take a look at that. We want to focus on public structure infrastructure in particular, uh, which means government involvement and usually um, in earlier dynamic models, it's only sectors in the A matrix that were able to buy infrastructure. And now we want a uh, final demand um, actor to be able to order public infrastructure. And we want to get much more, or we want to start to get into the price dual, um, a payment schedule, the sources of funding, and the ability to repay the loan. Okay, now I want to suggest that it's really important to put this within a model of the world economy for a number of reasons. And the, the models that, that we work with, that my, my colleagues and I um, work with, are the world trade model and the rectangular cho um, choice um, of technologies, technological options. And both of them and the combined model um, are, are um, constrained optimization models built around uh, George Danzig's linear programming, um, which can get more complex than what I showed you before, um, but it's able to accommodate these options um, with a, a very uh, direct representation of the, the phenomena. And so what we need to introduce in moving into the dynamic, into the uh, world, the global framework is factor mobility, um, built capital and money capital moving from one place to another, which we've never had in our world model uh, before. <clears throat> and what this means is that if some region or some country is wanting to put some infrastructure in place. It can be done domestically, um, but it could also be done by a foreign contractor. So it's not as if the, the bridge is going to be um, exported, but it's rather that the foreign producer is going to come and do the construction in another place. Um, so the mobility is um, ordering the contractors, um, the payments, because in paying for the, the this uh, for this built capital, um, one can get loans domestically. One can have a fund already at hand and not even need to borrow, or one can borrow globally from another region. Then one incurs debt and it has to be paid back. For that matter, foreign direct investment, which may not involve payments and debt or or ordering. Um, but with foreigners coming in to invest in another place also would make use of the same kind of price dual uh, for this model. Now, um, I want to say a little bit about um, households and lifestyles because this is something that I realize, I feel I finally see what's happening because there's a literature out there that says that households and lifestyles have been much less examined than technologies. And um, that was not immediately obvious to me. But then I've realized that all of the 
uh, scenarios, the alternative scenarios that I've analyzed have in fact been um, scenarios about alternative technologies. And never did the right-hand side of household lifestyles get changed in these, in, in these um, alternative scenarios. Now, I know that um, all of the footprint work has been very valuable in revealing um, the lifestyle or the consumption purchases, let, let's call it, in identifying the ones that are, say, uh, the most carbon intensive, that, that have the greatest carbon um, emissions. But um, that's a different story from um, having alternative scenarios about how households might realistically uh, change how they live. And I think that, um, as, as I said, having read the last few weeks, um, quite a number of um, studies by other social scientists, and by that I mean not economists, but sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, political scientists, to, to some extent, um, is um, that we need now to start um, collaborating intensively with social scientists about households and, and lifestyles. Um, and so we know that some of the most important considerations are um, that distinguish the lifestyles of different households are affluence, the composition of the household, um, individuals leaving, living alone, two people living together, um, many people that are not related living together. Um, these things change over time just as technologies change over time. And there can also be um, very sharp changes in households, in household lifestyles, just as there can be uh, disruptive technologies that are quite different from what they were in the past. Um, and I, I give a citation down here, the only one that I use, because this paper I found particularly valuable for me to get a new insight about this subject. Um, and um, what in, in, this, in this study, um, there were deep, deep interviews of lots of households in four countries in Europe. And there was an effort to distinguish the kinds of behavioral changes people in different kinds of households um, were um, not only willing, but eager to make or ready to make, willing to make, not willing to make, that ones that even if it was imposed, there were ones that they were very reluctant to do and others that they were ready to do. And uh, the ones that they were ready to do voluntarily had the least impact on reducing a carbon equivalent emissions. And so one of the many uh, conclusions of this particular study was that it's going to be necessary to have policies uh, that um, either um, stimulate, um, that at least make people aware of what the most important behavioral changes are, um, and in, in some cases to impose them through regulations or the kinds of sanctions, um, just as we're used to for um, treating te technology. Um, and then in the analysis, um, one would have alternative lifestyle scenarios. Um, for now, they would be exogenous vectors of, of lifestyle, of consumption for different categories of house, households. Um, and eventually, I think that that representation um, will have to become more um, internalized also, not only all um, being exogenous variables. But to have different lifestyle scenarios, one needs a classification of lifestyles, 
that makes sense for this kind of inquiry. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there are ways to categorize households so that one can cover them all. It can have to do with only affluence. Um, one can use the ones that marketers use, um, which is what I did years ago when I worked on households. Um, but the, the, um, the household classifications that were developed for marketing um, were well precisely, precisely designed for marketing. Now we want a classification of households um, that puts together in a category um, kinds of households, how they live, excuse me, and what kinds of changes um, they are going to be able and willing to take, as opposed to other households that maybe are just as in the same category from an affluence point of view, but that um, are not prepared or just absolutely not going to um, say, give up animal products in their diet, which happens to be one of the um, most important uh, considerations. So um, the objective is to carry out empir empirical studies where one has um, a modeling framework that can um, deal with these issues that I've mentioned. And um, I think that a very vital step is the stra strategies that one wants to analyze and the alternative scenarios to analyze, to compare for each given strategy. And I think that requires collaboration, meaning economists, yes, and engineers and so so sociologists um, and other kinds of views also. Um, I think that's a really important part, not just a secondary consideration in carrying out an ambitious large scale um, study of the world economy. Um, I think that a collaboration on the questions to ask is really important. And I, I, I meant to say that the reason, there are two reasons that I think it's vital to put this inquiry in a global context. And one is, more than obvious, which is that these are global problems. Um, but the second, which is of course related, is that we don't exactly have um, cooperative agents uh, representing the different countries on the globe today. Very hard to cooperate even under uh, for much smaller kinds of decisions. And I think that um, it's really important to look at the question from the global point of view in terms of what's optimal or what's preferable one thing to another, as opposed to doing individual studies, they're, they're vital too, of course, um, but the individual studies for individual economies are looking for what's best for that economy and putting it in a global context makes the global benefit um, what one is looking at, and I think that, that that is vital in order to have um, cooperation at a global level. Okay, we need data sources on, on the technologies. We need data on, we, we need not only the scenarios, but the data to represent the scenarios of household change as well as technological change. And here I come back to Vasily Leontiev's observation that that strategy, that, that theorizing and um, empirical data need to be seen by the same people and go back and forth. And so now it's not only collecting the data, studying the data in order to help um, motivate the structure of the model, but now that we have more complex models, if we use constrained optimization models, we also have the empirical results. And I know already from experience that um, the results are going to be surprising in some ways. And sometimes you realize you've made a mistake, but sometimes you get a new insight, which requires 
um, changing the model to accommodate what you've learned from the empirical results. And I think that um, finally that retaining the transparency of the model logic is vital. Uh, the simple impl implement um, input output model, the logic is evident. And I think the simplest linear program that I showed you earlier on is also um, transparent. But even as you go to increasingly complex pro linear programs or nonlinear programs, for that matter, also, the potential is there to keep the transparency of the model evident. And I think it's really important um, to do that because otherwise, not only does it undermine um, the the uh, value of the model, but it also makes it much harder to um, interpret the results if one doesn't have a clear sense of what the logic behind the model is. And last but not least, um, the pursuing um, the development of a set of household classifications, uh, just as we have standard industrial classifications, um, it's time to do that. Now, I realize that I've, I've, um, what I've talked about involves many things that have not yet been done, but I, we don't have to wait to do everything in order to start um, in this direction. And so um, in my own work, the models that I use don't, don't come near um, encompassing all the ideas that I've laid out, but I still think that we get incremental improvement as we add some of these features as we go. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Faye. Um, <clears throat> now we stop our recording and we start uh, our Q&A session.